right, so welcome friends. Uh, this is Will Costello, Master Sommelier and the Estates Ambassador for Bienvenido and Solomon Hills Estate Wines, bringing you another Psalm School with a focus on trade focused uh, kind of education because we know that nobody's doing, uh, bringing you in wine samples to try right now and most of our restaurants are still closed. Uh, these are the dogs in the back who decide to make themselves <laughs> known in every single episode. Uh, today I have a very good friend, uh, Joe Spellman. I think we've known each other since, I think when I was a certified sommelier and you've been a uh, guide for a lot of my career. And uh, hey, please guys, come on. Can't you tell we're on camera? Um, to, talk, to talk about high acid wines. And obviously high acid wines are important in the wine industry because you know, I didn't get a chance to drink a lot of 1930s and 1940s and 1950s wines, but I can tell you that with Riesling being the number one grape varietal sold all around the world for a long time, at some point in our history, people must have loved uh, high acid wine. And that trend comes and goes. And I'm very excited to uh, have you here today to talk about not only your history as a sommelier, where you came from and where you see yourself going, but also just your opinions on high acid wines in general. So uh, yep. tell us who you are and, and what your background is. Well, I'm glad to be with you, Will, and I uh, hope everybody is uh, enjoying a, a nice summer day. Uh, I have been working, well, I was a sommelier for the first 18 years or so of my career and the, the back uh, 15 or 20 now I've been uh, working with wineries. And um, I think, you know, going back to the beginning of my uh, restaurant career, uh, when I was a bartender who didn't know anything about wine and then learned wine in one of Chicago's early wine bars, um, I, I was, as most of us are, grounded in classics. Um, although at the time, emerging in the early 80s was a lot of interesting wine out of California and even the beginnings of New Zealand, Australia, and so forth. Um, but, you know, we didn't really pay much attention to acid at that time. Uh, we're just trying to wrap our arms around names like Gewurztraminer mm -hmm. or, you know, Chenin Blanc or, uh, you know, Baron Auslese, I suppose, you know. Um, and then uh, I think I really started paying more attention to wine flavor and structure when I was a true sommelier on the floor a few years after that, uh, a position that was thrust upon me, by the way, um, in a restaurant uh, that was a very formal French restaurant. We wore tuxedos. We had a great chef who came in from Alsace. That was key. And uh, the restaurateur I worked for uh, at that time was a guy named George Badonsky, who uh, was one of Chicago's more celebrated restaurateurs, had taken over a very famous space, Maxine's, uh, and made it kind of into his own new idea, although ultimately it didn't really work out. But he had quite a wine collection and a lot of that collection and his real love was Burgundy. So that's where I started tuning into food and wine pairing and understanding acid levels as being critical, particularly with a, a chef from Alsace who was bringing Pequot flavors into the mix, mm -hmm. as well as other, you know, more classical French flavors. Uh, yeah, they use a lot of gastriques and you have oh, things like chacrut, of course, which is nice and high acid as well. Makes right. Fatty sausage and stuff like that, foie gras flavors. Yeah, and we had a lot of classic dishes, but I think he did spins on things. And uh, Chef Joho, who's still active in Chicago uh, at Everest, one of the great restaurants in the country, in my view, and certainly one of the greatest Alsace wine lists anywhere. Uh, Chef uh, was a great teacher. He's a stern teacher in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, but he also really supported local ingredients. So at that time, and this is 1985. 84, 85, he's bringing in fish from uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. He's bringing in vegetables from Michigan uh, and doing unique sort of merges of a lot of those flavors because in a way they reminded him of the kinds of things available uh, in a mountainous uh, cool region like Alsace, but he also wanted to be very much driven by ingredients. And I think that was an early phase of that idea, not so much farm to table, but uh, making local flavors very important in the wine, uh, it, in, in the restaurant, excuse me. Now, local wine, <laughs> that was another story. There wasn't a whole lot of great interest, but George was a big supporter of Michigan wineries. So I got to know a lot of hybrid varieties uh, that were trying hard to, to be good classic styles, although they tend to be a little bit sweet. Um, and 
we would do uh, a few pairings and pour those by the glass to support some of his uh, friends from upstate Michigan. On the other hand, I don't know that they're the best food wines. I really got tuned in, like I said, to Burgundy, to the, rate, the, the, the kind of hierarchy of Alsace, uh, Alsace, the hierarchy of Chablis, and of course, the hierarchy of the Cote d'Or. Um, and while I wasn't buying a lot of those wines, I had the opportunity to taste quite a few. Uh, and that's when you start feeling like this is we, what we talk about at base with food and wine matching. Could I tell you an, uh, a, a pH level of any of those wines? Yeah. No. Yeah. Or an acid level? No. Or even a sugar level or an oak level? No. Uh, I don't think we talked in those terms at that, at that time. Uh, and we all knew the alcohol levels were ish, you know, uh, the standard, you know, table wine or 12.5 right. was on every bottle. So, right. uh, and you didn't measure them. You didn't, you didn't think about it, you know? Uh, so acidity then was a baseline. Oh, what about champagne? I mean, that was another thing. And I think uh, early experiences for me with really high-end champagne, particularly Blanc de Blanc champagne, mm. Uh, whether it was very young or very old, that's where acid really keeps that stuff together. And it was right. critical, uh, exciting uh, flavor profile to work with, particularly good Blanc de Blanc champagnes. And many more were emerging at that time. Well, the reason that I invited you specifically is because you and your winery are a neighbor to Biennecito to the yeah. north, right? And Santa Maria Valley particularly is classified as a region 1b Winkler scale it's one of the coolest wine regions in uh, the United States it matches temperatures of things like Champagne it matches Dijon and Burgundy Comptal in Austria but when you look just to the north in San Luis Obispo Paso Robles while it has pockets of you know heat and certainly you can get 107 degree temperatures in the summer I mean the Paso Robles Highlands for example uh, Templeton Gap are all areas that tend to be much cooler and have an ocean influence as opposed to being, uh, you know, hot climate, more desert is what we would think about it. And I wanted to get your particular opinion because I think you guys have done such a great job uh, as a winery of crafting not only wines that average consumers love to drink, they recognize your wine, they certainly know you have the achievement of your highest end wines like isosceles, but even at your, you know, by the glass entry level wine uh, for like Justin Cabernet, there is this beautiful balance of acid structure that makes it really good for food, whether you're at a steakhouse or at a bistro, matched with that ripeness of California. So what, and I, you know, I wanted to get your opinion. Has your opinion shifted like many of the wineries in the past, you know, five or six years to follow the trend? Or have what you've been doing, you know, for a dozen years stayed on course? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts here. And thank you for reeling me back in from Europe uh, to talk about what we're uh, most interested in right now. Uh, yes, I've been with Justin 13 years now, uh, almost. And the, uh, the style of wine, I think, has been very consistent. However, I think what's happened, uh, you know, factors you're talking about, like proximity to the Pacific Ocean, so critical. Mm -hmm. uh, another really important one for us is elevation. Mm -hmm. So out west where we have the Santa Lucia Highlands, uh, we're up to 15, 16, 1700 feet above sea level and within 10 miles of the ocean. Yeah. Those are combining factors, you know, moving parts that really help us out, along with fairly basic soils. So a lot of calcareous soils in the region, uh, especially out west, old seabed. So that's a factor you don't see in too many other parts of California, uh, a lot of which is volcanic, some of which is you know, sand driven. Uh, of course, Santa Barbara County is largely uh, old seabed as well. But uh, I think to your point, temperature wise, we are surprisingly competitive. In fact, we often say in the Western sector of Paso Robles, Adelaide District, uh, our average temperature over the course of a year, even though we do get hot days, is lower than the average temperature of the Napa Valley floor, for instance. Right. Of course, you know, we're famous for Cabernet and Paso has a long history with Zin and a long kind of growing history with Rhone varieties. And yeah, it's a red wine zone, no doubt about it. Right. But I think those factors really help us hold some acidity. And in the use function of the wine, and I'm glad you mentioned the Justin Cabernet, because while isosceles is richer, higher in alcohol, more French oak influenced, 
Right. Uh, our basic Cabernet uh, has very little new oak, less than 30% in any given year, and that's usually American. Uh, but uh, it's all about vineyard management and working with the people we source from, as well as our own uh, properties, to bring in fruit that does not get overripe. And that really has to do with dropping fruit, you know, managing testing the duration and beyond, um, and getting the right picking dates so that we're not picking overripe fruit, which I think was a history in Paso for many decades. Um, one of the problems with Zinfandel, if you're a Zinfandel farmer quite often, uh, you're picking un underripe berries and overripe berries on the same cluster. At least I've heard that from Zin people. Uh, that's probably gotten tighter as time has moved on, but um, you know they've they gotten more selective about clusters. But uh, that was always a reason to kind of let Zin go too long. And if you grow Cabernet like that, well, you end up with jam and you know heavy juice sorts of flavors. So I think for us Cabernet with some acidity, it's really important. Um, our pHs do kind of drift up a bit and hit that 3.6 level or so, um, 3.7 in, in some mm -hmm. cases. Um, and I think, you know, there's certainly a history of the palate of the wine drinker of the country evolving and right. pre preferring richness, preferring dark color, preferring black fruit, preferring higher alcohol. And this right. maybe was a critical move um, or preference uh, based on journalism of the late 90s and through the 2000s. Right. Uh, but I think we sommeliers always kind of want to say, hey, rein it in, tighten it up, you know, keep the acids. Uh, let's not try to be too blousy here. Uh, and it's better for the wine in the long term, too. Well, do you yourself like high acid wines? I sure do. I, I love Chablis. I love Sancerre. Yeah. I love, you know, Riesling. Uh, Shannon. I've been drinking a lot of Loire Valley Shannon lately. Um, and, and even with a little sugar, I mean, I, I don't mind that. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's really key to a balanced wine and it finds so well with food flavors, depending what you're cooking. Well, you um, know, interesting thing that, you know, you see across the industry and, you know, I'm, I'm particularly now that I work for a winery and work closely with our winemaker, I always like to see our lab results come back. I like to see where our pH is. I like to see our TA. I like to see the alcohol, none of which we are trying to, manipulate by harvesting early or by, you know, putting in more underripe fruit or whatever. But it's interesting to see how the consumer, and I'll use my mom as a, a specific, she was out here in Vegas a couple weeks back and she had gotten her shipment of the new vintage Solomon Hills 2018 Chardonnay. And she opened it with my dad at home and she says, gosh, that wine was so sweet. And, you know, wow. For those of you who know anything about wine chemistry, this wine had 12.9% alcohol, 3.12 pH, Ooh. and 7.3 TA. So if you looked at it on like a chemical dip, it would look like lemon juice. And mm. she's saying it's sweet. And I'm going, wow, like my head's fun because even as much as I've spoken to consumers for years and years as a sommelier on the floor and now at wine dinners and all of these things, the last word I ever expected to come out of someone's mouth regarding that wine was sweet, which is, you know, I, I'm still flabbergasted right now. I haven't had time to- He was after think. a little slice of goat cheese, you know, that'll always change a palate, right? Yeah. And I think context is so critical for that perception. You know, speaking of what I would think of as pretty dry wines seeming sweet. I hear that about a lot of New Zealand, you know, Marlboro Sauvignon Blancs. Mm -hmm. That perception is there's a sweetness there. Uh, and sometimes there is actually, but you know, they're, they're so high acid, uh, it's kind of masked and, and overbalanced in some way. And if but any, I'm not surprised to hear that comment. They're harvesting in New Zealand at 110 hectoliters per hectare. <laughs> phenolically underripe to preserve yeah. those kind of like savory styles of the wine and they're still Racers sweet too, yeah <laughs> it's so funny so and yeah you, i mean the perception i think it has to do with what how we approach the palate and how aromatics influence you know and set the table for the palate and i think the a lot of tasters don't pay attention to structure they really don't they mm -hmm. let the fruit aromas drive the entire perception of the wine yeah uh, maybe until they get to the finish and then they're saying, oh, well, that is crisp and lively or that tastes great with the piece mm -hmm. of, you know, crab I just ate or whatever. But um, 
I think they're maybe not paying as much attention as we often do. Uh, and the sommelier by the table kind of talk about acidity and balancing the flavor right. uh, it is often sound, sounds like a lot of voodoo to people. Um, but once in a while you break through to somebody and, and the, uh, the aha moment happens and that's kind of fun. I used You're to do actually... that with Bruner. When I was at Charlie Trotter's, you know, in the mid nineties, uh, the Austrian wine kind of renaissance was in full swing. And we worked lots of Gruner and Riesling, of course, uh, and always had a Gruner by the glass and always tried to open people's minds to it and, and eyes to it. And it was still kind of an uphill struggle, but, you know, I think it was part of a, a, a style that was repositioning white wine acidity as a very important uh, backbone element when we had so many heavily oaked Chardonnays in the market that were mm -hmm. driving the image particularly of California wine. And then later, we had a problem with that in, in Burgundy, where I thought ripening was a little, little, went a little far. You had the Primox problem occurring in some Burgundies. Uh, and uh, that, I, know, I think there's still a lot of mystery about that, but uh, you know, it seems to be related to climate change and warmth and lo losing acidity, uh, right. creating different farming regimens, you know? Um, and you know, we, we, at our other winery landmark, we often talk about going to the Central Coast. While we're a Sonoma winery, we get a lot of fruit. Uh, right. Pinot Noir in Santa Lucia Highlands and both Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in Santa Barbara County. Uh, some even historically from Solomon Hills yeah. and Mendocino. So you know, we're, we're looking there for the same reasons um, because we want our style of Chardonnay at landmark to have that sort of undercut edge that a lot of Sonoma Chardonnays do not. Well, you're kind of leading the conversation to where exactly I wanted to get to when you talked about, you know, how to introduce and sell higher acid wines, because we have so many people who watch this who are studying for their advance and studying for their master exam and who are on the floor as sommeliers or servers or wine directors. And, you know, the, not just the verbiage, which, which we as the quartermaster sommeliers try to avoid uh, pushing candidates to use acid and those kind of words, tannin and structure. We want them to use more flowery language like cut or precision or freshness or whatever. But is there for somebody, and let's just paint a picture of, you know, the person who started collecting wine in the early 2000s, who bought 15 and a half percent alcohol, high oaked Cabernet. That's the majority of what they have in their cellar. They've sort of developed a palate for their softer, sweeter fruit, higher oak. And they are eager to listen to the sommelier to taste something else. They don't necessarily know that if they're having an arugula salad with just a lemon vinaigrette and high acid Parmesan and like pine nuts on their salad that they should have something that's not Cabernet. How should someone guide that conversation into you know, high acid wines? Well, I'm gonna go back to the farm to table idea, which became very prominent still is uh, with locally sourced ingredients and you know farmers market uh, local food, uh, driving a lot of plates, keeping things fresh, simpler cooking. Uh, chefs, you know, love them, but quite often create a certain acid balance on the plate that is hard to fight with or merge into with wine. And I think uh, so many pickled flavors these days and Pequot other flavors like you were talking about before can be a big challenge. Um, and I, I think what's happened there is uh, because the food is not of a tradition, it is not, you know, spaghetti and meatballs, it is not steak free, it is not, you know, uh, sole with lemon butter sauce, uh, but it is some other range of really interesting sounding flavors, but you don't really know what's going to be on the plate, yeah. you know? So that's when the sole is really important to say, wow, you know, we've had this dish and we're working with wine X or wine Y or wine Z, and it's been very successful. And it's just like, you know, a personal comment mm -hmm. uh, without maybe even necessarily getting into the why. Uh, right. You know, it, it's more of personal endorsement that helps. And I think in those kinds of environments that are not of a tradition or not a steakhouse, uh, you know, uh, the guest who is open-minded and they're not all is going to say, hey, well, this is interesting what should I have? And trust. And I think certain restaurants that have serious presentations of their food 
uh, and serious presentations of their service and their, the way they articulate things at Tableside are going to engender more trust in the people right. recommending right. the wines. And quite often wine lists, it, it's often frustrating to people like me, you know, to break into them because the wine list is largely comprised of things the guest has never heard of. Uh, yeah. And that is often because of, you know, small, they want to work with small production producers. They want to, you know, find wine from emerging regions. Right. Uh, the whole idea of unsulfured and other versions of, uh, you know, pet nat and so forth. I dare not use the other word uh, as a, a you know, oh, an work. entire category becomes valuable in a way at that time. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying, you know, they, the question is, is there a perfect bottle of wine? Because, you know, flavors and palates and super tasters who are much more, you know, attuned to bitterness or even, you know, style of food with regionality, I'm sure that North Carolina or Carolina barbecue in general that is laden with acidity, probably the people of North Carolina and South Carolina are more likely to get into higher acid wines than maybe someone in, you know, stew country where, you know, they have a lot of heavy, powerful, rich, you know, poutine or something like that. Wisconsin, maybe where you're, you know, constantly having cheese and thick sauce and all of that stuff on there that are going to clash seriously with that. Is, is there a perfect bottle of wine if you had to describe it in terms of acid and oak, or is this completely subjective? Yeah, I think it's in the moment, you know. Uh, I, I think I agree with you that, you know, pork barbecue with the high vinegar component is a, is a challenge for wine. And what gets produced around there has nothing to do with food and wine because it's right. Dupernong and Magnolia. And so right. Uh, so it's not even really a, a serious wine culture. Uh, in the way that it evolved in other places. But um, uh, I think there is an argument certainly for leaner, lighter, crisper wines with a little sweetness. I think sweetness, again, comes in very handy when you're working with vinegars. I, you know, vinegar, pickled things, uh, green vegetables, fresh fruit are all big challenges for wine. Um, and they're all very popular in culinary worlds that we're, you know, operating in. So uh, I think the, that what makes the most sense is that sort of baseline that can stand up to those flavors, uh, maybe even combat them a little bit. And hopefully there's a sauce or a butter regimen uh, or, or, or a dairy regimen within the dish that helps bring it up. Uh, on the other hand, you talk about a heavily cheesed sauce, you know, uh, uh, you know, mac and cheese that's everywhere, right? Uh, or <laughs> I don't know if Wisconsinites eat poutine, but I know what you're getting at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they use cheese curds, right? <laughs> yeah, curds, squeaky curds. Uh, you know, but <laughs> they do use a lot of cheese up there. Uh, and, and of course, it's a beer culture, you know, and, or right. in the winter, it's a brandy Manhattan culture, brandy old fashioned or whatever. So um, I'd say that uh, the culinary uh, ideas of place don't really adhere much to wine histories, mm. um, but we are bringing more a wine appreciation to those right. local culinary scenes because people like wine. They're yeah. adopting it. They, they they've embraced it. Whether they have embraced you know White Zin twenty five years ago or you know the latest uh, you know orange wine from Slovenia yesterday, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're not going to find either of those everywhere, but at least they have a baseline from which they can have a conversation. And that's key. Get the conversation going. And, and my biggest, you know, way to introduce people to wine always had to do with weather and, you know, sunshine or, you know, cold winter days. To me, you know, it, it was about how the wine makes you feel because that same person mm -hmm. I talked about before who drank Cabernet from the early 2000s and they have a cellar full of it and that's what they collect. I guarantee if they came over to my house and we were sitting outside in Las Vegas at 105 degrees in the middle of summer and I bring them a even cellar temp glass of Cabernet at 3.7 pH and you know 15 and a half percent alcohol, 
they'd much rather have a beer or they'd like to have a glass of lightly off dry Chenin Blanc, right? And to me, I always tried to introduce it from a feeling perspective. Like, you know, the amazing thing about why you would drink a wine like, you know, even Demi Sec or Sec style Chenin Blanc from Loire is because it has the the taste of sunshine, the brightness of fresh lemons and that green crisp apple. And it gives you the feeling of wanting to go back and take another drink and another drink and another drink. It's never going to make you feel heavy. It's never going to overpower your meal either. There is a case to be made for drink what you like and just enjoy it, right? Because if you are the person that has a cellar full of wine, why now go explore a whole world where you're going to spend more money or have a seller that you're not going to drink. But the experience alone of, you know, I think about uh, Smith Madrone from Napa Valley, Sam Smith, he makes some Riesling on the property up there uh, in Spring yeah. Mountain. And I don't generally think of Napa Valley and Riesling together, but when you're up at his property, way up above the fog line, it's cool even when the valley floor is hot and you're drinking a glass of Riesling overlooking, you know, across the valley at the Vacas and enjoying this. That makes me think of being like wanting to grab my jacket and put it on because it's cool, not Napa. And that alone is a reason why you would want to, or at least I would want to introduce high acid wines or a varying style of wine to people's glossary of different wine experiences. Tastes a lot better when you're there too, you know? Yeah. And there, are, there are pockets of really good Riesling still in Napa, you know, Stony Hill is still doing it mm -hmm. and Drefeffin still does a really good dry Riesling. And I think they've evolved their farming. They've evolved their places where they're growing it. Um, and there's more to Napa than Cabernet. You have to give them credit for that. Uh, but I think Paso Robles too has that, this amazing diversity. And while it is like 85% planted of red grapes, one of the best Chardonnays I've had recently was maybe by Pax Maley a few years ago yeah. from, uh, uh, the, uh, what's his name, uh, Berry Farm um, in, in near Templeton. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like James Sack Berry from James Berry yeah. Vineyard. It, yeah. Amazing, fantastic, Burgundian sort of Chardonnay. Uh, so, you know, there, there's po pockets in Paso too. I can't think of anybody who's making Riesling now that I say that, but <laughs> uh, there's a lot of other things being tried, whether it's a Rhone white or, um, you know, pretty good racy Sauvignons here and there. Um, that's really kind of the extent of it that I see. But um, like our style of Viognier, it's very dry, no new oak, you know, really clean uh, and a great food wine for that reason. It's not oily or unctuous. And I don't think we'd ever use it in a blind tasting in the MS exam because it doesn't behave like Viognier, you know? Right. And this is one of the important things about high acid wines, I guess, if you look in the world. And I'm, you know, I think 99 out of 100 scientists agree that uh, climate change and global warming is affecting, you know, obviously the oceans in terms of their CO2 count and vineyards, especially where otherwise very cool climates are now able to fully ripen Pinot Noir or other grape varietals. And how, I mean, look at the British sparkling wine industry, right? Where this was a complete hybrid focused uh, industry on Muller Turgau and things that are cold hardy. And now they can start making rosés out of 100% Pinot Noir in the region. I what like the uh, future of the Okanagan Valley too for Pinot. Yeah. And Chardonnay, you know, I mean, as things keep uh, pushing north, there are parts of California that are under severe threat with the way the heat patterns are going to continue. And I don't quite know that it's the, you know, frog in the pan that gets warmer and warmer. Uh, and suddenly we realize, geez, we can't grow Cabernet here anymore. But I think people are planning for the future now uh, what to do, especially on hot, low, uh, low uh, elevation sites. This is, this is the question that goes back to that, like, artificial style. And I won't use that word you didn't want to use either. But, you know, where they're picking the grapes early to... Kind of highlight the green herbal nature of it. You know, phenolic ripeness is phenolic ripeness. Just because you add heat to something and you have to pick it now at the beginning of August doesn't mean that that Cabernet or whatever is going to taste good, right? And so it's seemingly that 
the regions that are naturally producing high acid wines on their own without that decision to pick early uh, are not going the way of the dodo, but severely being limited in their scope. And it's interesting because my, my theory here is that the high acid wines of the world will likely become less and less tolerated by general consumers or wine drinkers because the ability to make them without adding tartaric or picking early are going to be limited more and more and more. And that we're going to see styles that are um, higher alcohol and richer just by virtue of lack of great growing regions to keep high acid. Well, I think the artisanal producers and the savvy growers, though, will become a, a narrow sliver of luxury wine that is of a natural high acid without adjustment, uh, as has Burgundy has become, you know, uh, as to some extent uh, Champagne has become, uh, although they keep growing Champagne, don't they? Um, but the <laughs> they invented Champagne in 2003, so I mean, they'll do anything. Expand the borders, you know? Is what I'm talking about. But no, I think um, where wine is in a beautiful textural place that will live a long time with natural acidity and still enough body and flavor to, to be interesting and distinctive and say something about place, those are going to be very small percentage of, of overall wine produced as they are now, you know, if you think about it. Um, what are the biggest, if you, I'm sure you've seen, you know, the top 10 selling wines in the United States, and almost all of them have pretty high residual sugar. Uh, quite a few of them, if we looked at them and had a tasting, we would wonder about their varietal character being, you know, appropriate. Uh, but, but they stand for what those varieties are to most consumers. So we're already talking in a pretty narrow clip of what's in the restaurant business what sommeliers work with, what yeah. they, the high-end consumer is going to pay, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80 dollars for. Well, would you be interested to answer a couple questions that uh, some people posted? One, one of which is a gentleman named Phil Pierce. Love Phil. Uh, he hey, says, Phil, Phil Pierce, Pierce comes to Bruno, and he wants to know what is harder to make an espresso for Tony T or to taste and discuss a complex wine. Oh, I say the former. The espresso gig when I was with the Terlados, and I learned a lot there. It was a great experience. Uh, but yeah, the, the lunch um, protocols there and uh, management of the tabletop uh, was in many ways more challenging than Charlie Trotter's. And I never had to make espresso at Charlie Trotter's. So, Well, he, Charlie Trotter is the only chef that I ever heard who talked about firing his guests. So I'm, I'm sure if you're <laughs> And that is the truth. That means something. <laughs> yeah, I think I almost got fired at that uh, dining table a couple times with the Terlados, but no, I'm still getting along great with them. Joe, you're a good man. You're a good friend. You're clearly very educated about the wine industry and about not only the, the regions that are well known, but also the up and coming ones. I want to thank you for your time. And, uh, you know, if you want to come back on, I got a couple shows that I'm trying to still develop, one of which people wanted to hear about mentorship in the wine mm -hmm. industry. And, you know, you've been a mentor of mine for a long time, so I uh, would ha be happy to have you. But to share with some people who are interested in some upcoming ones that we're going to do, we're actually going to talk about vineyard versus AVA versus region and which is more important on wine labels or even for consumers, how to speak about Rhone varietals, how to price a wine to sell on a wine list, which I'm really quite excited mm -hmm. to talk about with uh, Augusto Ferro. a whole new horizon after the... Uh... Yeah. And uh, what is the state of, um, I'm going to say it right now, natural wine these days? <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Hey, this is really cool what you're doing with your series. And uh, anytime, let me know if I can hop on. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>